did not break its losing streak this past weekend, but that was in part because no game was played. Hello everybody and welcome to the latest episode of Miami Total Football Radio, aka Miami Total Football Radio. I am half of the co-hosting team of this podcast, the number one inter-Miami podcast here in South Florida, and joining me this week is not El Primo, he is absent again, but like I said last week, like I promised we have another special guest who covers Inter-Miami on the regular, is a soccer media veteran, his name is Jose Armando. Jose, how are you, brother? Hey, Franco. Um, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I mean, we were supposed to do this uh, podcast um, after um, the Red Bull match, but still, we're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to talk about a lot of Inter-Miami, what's going on with Inter-Miami, so I'm excited to share. Um, for the first time, by the way, you invited me for the first time, so um, I like that. Hopefully, it's not the last time. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I'm glad. You, listen, I'm glad you came on. We talked about this last week. Uh, I was thinking, I was like, who else can we get? on that covers the team regularly that's in market and I was like you know what Jose Jose came to mind and Jose does a great job for those of you who may not be as familiar with Jose he does a great job for Deporte Total USA it's predominantly in Spanish so you would have to read Spanish or you can do the Google Translate thing if you want to follow <laughs> Jose Jose's um Jose's coverage but it's worth it Jose is rightfully so as critical of the team when they're des- when they are deserving of being criticized, um, but he does follow the team on on a very regular basis. He's around at practice sessions and at games, so Jose knows the team very very well. Jose, just so people can have a little more insight into who you are and what you do. Obviously, I told them Deporte Total USA, but how long have you been with Deporte Total USA? How long have you been covering soccer? Where are you from? Just give them a little background so they get to know a little bit more about you. Well, I was born in Honduras, and so, well, you know, soccer is in my blood. And um, I'm, I've been covering soccer in the United States for 10 years, maybe, mm-hmm. somewhere around 10 years. Um, and um, I've seen everything in South Florida. Um, I, I've covered, um, since I love the game, and, and I don't get too much involved with the teams, you know, I'm, I'm not that type of guy that is going to... Um, you know, it's gonna it's gonna be a, a fan oriented coverage per se, right? Um, I just love the game, and and I try to analyze the game yeah. because I think that will serve better a better purpose for for the people reading whatever I write or or listening to whatever um, podcast I'm invited to or recording. Sure. So, um, I've been through ups and downs here in South Florida, of course, as you know. Um, teams coming in and out at all levels, and PSL. Um, now USL is here, MLS, of course. And I was just thinking about it just a few days ago while I was covering Gold Cup. And looking back at what the landscape in terms of soccer is in South Florida, that, you know, just years ago when Gold Cup was here, it was like, oh, my gosh, the excitement of having an official match, an important match and not just a friendly in South Florida was just very exciting. Yeah. And now... When the, when the Gold Cup came here for the preliminary rounds and they were over, I was like, all right, it feels nice that in just a few days I'm going to have an official match actually here in the same stadium in Fort Lauderdale. <laughs> you know, I, I don't have to wait two years, four years for something official to come this way. So, you know, I've been through a lot and, and I think it's been a good a learning experience as well. And just, to, you know, excited about what Inter Miami brings now. Even even though the results are not what many people expected, my expectations about this team are not as high as uh, as what you what you read in normally in social media and read in in some other outlets. Yeah, we'll touch on that. We'll we'll touch on your thoughts on the state of the team and why the team is where it's at right now. Um, but you also do cover other sports, correct? You don't just cover you cover predominantly soccer, but I think you also do some dolphin stuff and, and some other sports. Is that is that correct? Yes, that is correct. I do Dolphins, I do Miami Heat, Marlins as well. Basically, the entire South Florida sports landscape, except for hockey, because as you know, it's not very um, predominant in the Hispanic community. Sure. So, um, so and, and still, I mean, you wouldn't have time to do right. um, every single team in South Florida. But yeah. uh, I, I try to do a good job and just being there for for the teams, the games, and you know, it's just, it's a lot of fun. As you know, this this job is uh, it takes a lot of your time, yeah. and you can very easily be off on a Monday morning and 
enjoying your life, but then <laughs> it's Sunday night and you're working yeah. nonstop, right? So, you know, it's a lot of fun. Unpredictable, but a lot of fun. Yeah, when I, whenever I meet people and they ask me, oh, what's your schedule like? And I'm like, oh, I don't really have a set schedule. It kind of just goes up and down, different days, different hours, um, you know, like... This week, for example, there's a game on Wednesday night, so have Wednesday during the day off, but that's not normally uh, the usual circumstance. So, yes, this this is a labor of love. It definitely is a bit fluid and unpredictable in that way. Uh, if you guys want to follow Jose's work, you could follow him on Twitter at jarm21. That's how you would say it if it was in English. It's the letter J, arm21. Obviously, it stands for Jose Armando. 21 if we're looking at it in Spanish, but that's where you can follow Jose's work, not just on Inter Miami, for all the South Florida sports teams, or almost all of them. But Jose, let's switch gears. Let's talk about Inter Miami. We've got plenty of talk to talk about, so let's get to it. Okay, Jose, we were planning, like you mentioned earlier, to recap and analyze the game against the New York Red Bulls, which was supposed to take place on Saturday night at Red Bull Arena. I was really looking forward to talking to you, some X's and O's, some tactics, your analysis, because I like doing that. I like nerding out and and providing what I think and hearing other people's points of views about the actual just 90 minutes on the field. But unfortunately, that's not going to happen today because Saturday's game was postponed after a lengthy, lengthy weather delay that took three plus hours and the game never actually got underway right before the game began lightning delays started happening they came out for warm-ups later on another lightning delay so the game never happened what was your reaction to inter miami not being able to play this game because they obviously were at their healthiest that they've been in a while robbie robinson was back in the lineup gonzalo Higuain and rodolfo pizarro were as well this was as healthy as they've been especially in the attack and unfortunately due to mother nature they weren't able to get this game played yeah, I was kind of disappointed because, like you mentioned, it was like the time to um, go back to basics with Inter Miami and try to find a way to connect uh, Rolo Pizarro with Gonzalo Higuain. So I saw them in the lineup and I thought, ah, oh, man, maybe this is the night where they gel together and they just, they, you know, they, they, they become what we think of them in, in the future, what it would look like in the future, you know, that... Uh, a connection between this, those two guys. And, and now um, we're not able to see it. And um, I think it's too long a break now for them. And hopefully, you know, Phil Neville is finding a way to keep them in shape in terms of uh, competition. Um, it's been too long because they did, they'd had a break the a weekend yeah. before. They did not play a game. So um, I think this is too long. Yeah, and before we get into the New England Revolution game, I do want to try to recap some of what happened on Saturday in this ordeal where the game was postponed. Now, from what I've been told, from what I've gathered, is that the national anthem was played at Red Bull Arena. The game was about to begin. The substitutes were on the substitutes bench. The teams, the starting lineups, were in the tunnel. They were getting ready to come out onto the field. And the initial delay happened where lightning struck within i think it's an eight mile radius and the game had to be delayed they later came on started warming up team admin was there trying to deal with everything all the news the updates and as they came out to warm up a second time another lightning delay and the team again just spent most of the night in the locker room trying to stay loose playing some foot tennis some some soccer tennis um in in english um, Andres Reyes, who's a member of the New York Red Bulls, who was not on their match day roster, but was in the stadium, the former Inter Miami center back, he popped into Inter Miami's locker room and they chatted with him and had some catching up. So that must have been a nice moment, a nice way to, to help pass the time because obviously he, he had a lot of former teammates, a lot of friendships that he made last year. So that was some of what went on. Obviously, from what I've been told, this is mostly a league decision to to postpone. Um, excuse me, to delay the game and not call it off outright. So, if you're frustrated about that, if you're an Inter Miami fan that traveled, direct your frustrations towards MLS because, from what I've been told, they are the ones that make that call whether to delay or postpone outright. And obviously, it took them some time to do so. I've seen Red Bull fans that have been pretty upset about that that decision because of how long it took. People had to wait 
three plus hours um, for a final final decision. Some people say the game should have been called off well in advance, given that the forecast was was not looking was not looking too too bright. But like you said, Inter Miami now has had a longer a longer wait without games. You touched on Rodolfo Pizarro. I touched on Rodolfo Pizarro. This was going to be the first game that Inter Miami had that attacking front four of Robinson, Pizarro, Morgan, and Iguain since week two. The first time that that front four was going to play together since week two, or start together. Sorry, that might yeah. not, that might not happen now. That might not happen now because the news that just came out right before we started recording this is that Pizarro is apparently being called up to Mexico as an emergency replacement for Irving Chucky Lozano. Who, who was injured earlier in the Gold Cup, and Pizarro might be leaving for the Gold Cup duty, which would mean he misses Inter-Miami's matches or the next few matches. Now, if he's around for Wednesday, we'll see. You know, what do you think is going to happen there? Because it, this is a CONCACAF tournament, so teams are obliged to release their players. They have to release their players. If Mexico says, hey, I want, that, I want, um, I want Rodolfo Pizarro in camp tomorrow, they have to release him. Yes. Whereas, well, whereas if it was a friendly um, that doesn't fall in a window, they would not have to. Right. That is the case. Absolutely the case. And, and you know, this is a, a story that is developing because uh, um, usually um, Rodolfo Pizarro will not be allowed to come into the, the, um, the Mexican camp at mm-hmm. this time during the tournament. Although CONCACAF just uh, released a few moments ago a statement in which they are allowing... Um, for the 2021 edition of the Gold Cup, uh, um, t- players to come in after the group stage is done. So um, I think it looks like it's going to happen. Like yeah. honestly, and and I feel bad for Inter Miami fans because as soon as Rodolfo Pizarro looks like he's coming back, you know it, it's a shame. But that's the position in which good players are are put into, and Rodolfo Pizarro is that type of player. So I think it's going to be with the with the Mexican national team. And and it's a big moment for him because remember what has been going on in the past few months. He hasn't been able to play as much as he wanted. Next year there's a gold, uh, the World Cup. This year, uh, World Cup qualifiers. Yeah. You know, it's, if 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 he's thinking about um, taking that next step, he's going to need the national team. So you know, it's good for Inter Miami as well for him to get that type of competition. Now I wanted to ask you because obviously Inter Miami has a game on Wednesday, and I obviously this is a developing story, like you mentioned. I reached out to people that I know within the team to see what's going on, if he's going to be around for Wednesday's game, at least Wednesday's game, because Mexico doesn't play its quarterfinals until Saturday, if I'm not mistaken. But there's no answer yet. I imagine Inter-Miami is trying its hardest to find a way to keep him for Wednesday's game. But obviously, again, if Mexico has called him up, Inter-Miami has to release him. It cannot go against that. So... Do you think Tata Martino is flexible given that there's some time between now and Saturday to, okay, let Rodolfo Pizarro play on Wednesday? Or do you think he calls him up right away and says, he, you know, says, listen, we need him in camp and we need him in camp now? I think there's a chance. There's a chance that he plays for, for Inter Miami on Wednesday. But, you know, it's going to be up to, up to the team and up to the national team, the conversations that they're having. Yeah, it's, the more I think about it, because I was like, you know what, maybe they let him play, especially since he's going in to be an uh, emergency replacement, you know, probably not a starter for Mexico this weekend. But the, now the more that I think about it, I don't think he'll be available Wednesday. I think that they'll they'll take him um, to get him in camp. Obviously, they don't want to risk an emergency replacement getting right. injured on, you know, with their club team on Wednesday when they're trying to have him for emergency situations on Saturday. So I, think, I don't think Pizarro's going to be in. That's just my... Opinion or what I think right now as of today, Monday afternoon. Again, we it's a developing story. We don't have the information yet, but that's just what I would surmise or guess from as of today. Um, but let's talk about one player that we know definitely will not be available for Inter Miami on Wednesday, and that is Gregory, because Gregory was set to serve his one game ban or one game suspension for yellow card accumulation over the weekend against the New York Red Bulls. But since that game did not get played, that now has to be served on Wednesday. And that is a massive, massive loss because the New England Revolution are the Eastern Conference leaders of the top team in the East in first place right now. They've got quite a formidable attack with Gustavo Bo, Carles Gil, 
So Gregory was very important for Inter Miami in this one, as he is every game, but especially in this one, given the matchups, at least in my opinion, not having him is a really big blow. How much do you think Inter Miami will miss him against the New England Revolution on Wednesday? Yeah, they will miss him, no doubt about it. And you know, you mentioned um, um, what New England Revolution, what they have been able to do this year, is very impressive. You know, New England Revolution is that that team that. Um, that, um, you know, it's the complete opposite from Inter Miami at the moment because the New England Revolution, they are a very good team, but they don't have the flair, right, of the mm-hmm. David Beckham or the big names, right? Yeah. Uh, but they're just a very good team and they're in first place. And that's what hopefully someday Inter Miami becomes, right? Not only the David Beckham team, but a very good team that is in first place in MLS. So um, Gregory is going to be, uh, they're, they're going to miss him. Although, you know, I really liked a lot Victor Ulloa, what he did last game um, with uh, Blaise Matuidi in the middle. I think uh, he's a good compliment to to Blaise. And um, hopefully he can do it again. You know, Victor, he's a player with plenty of experience, knows um, how to deal with uh, MLS teams. And, you know, this is an opportunity for him as well to impress. It's going to be hard for him to take Gregory's spot moving forward. But, you know, if you take advantage of this type of opportunity, Opportunities, then moving forward, Phil Neville is going to feel that the need to put you in the starting 11 or to give you more minutes than when he used to before. Yeah, I, I liked Victor Uyo and Blaise Matuidi's partnership in the game against Orlando City, the last Inter Miami home game. I thought they, they had their best performances together. It might have been Victor Uyo's best performance in an Inter Miami jersey, you know, dating back to last year since the, since the team began. But if Gregory's out against this New England team, for me, that is a massive blow because you, you're going to need that type of enforcer. And Victor Ulloa, like we say in Spanish, is cumplidor. He's not necessarily <laughs> someone that's going to wow you or overwhelm you right. with any, any one thing. He's just kind of a, a good role player. And against New England, not having someone like Gregory, an enforcer, someone who, who makes his presence felt a little bit more in that midfield or a lot more in that midfield, that's going to be a big, big challenge to overcome because New England Revolution have the best attack in the in the Eastern Conference. They have 23 goals scored. Now, if you're looking league-wide, that's second best. Only Kansas City has more goals. Seattle also has 23. So Bruce Arena, who's doing a great job with the New England Revolution, he has this team ticking where, you know, Inter Miami is kind of in the opposite way, has the worst attack in the league right now, um, and is trying to find its way there. I think... It's going to be a massive challenge for Inter Miami on Wednesday without Gregory. But it was already going to be a big, big challenge because the New England Revolution are are, are hot right now. They're 8-3-3. Three, and three. Now, if you want to look for some reason of optimism, if you're an Inter Miami fan, it's the New England Revolution's away record this year. They have three wins, two losses, and three ties. So that's where they've kind of had some slip-ups. At home, they've been practically are almost flawless. They have one loss in six matches there. They won the other five. So away from home, New England Revolution hasn't hasn't been or haven't been as impressive, but still a tough challenge for Inter Miami. Well, absolutely. Listen, I hate to say it, but, you know, it's going to be a tough challenge for Inter Miami. You know, the table uh, tells the story. The standings tells, tells, tells the story. New England first place, Inter Miami last place. So, I mean... Again, I think expectations at times for Inter Miami are not where they should be, right? Mm -hmm. You know, even though you're playing at home and um, you have good players, at the time, at the moment, I think Inter Miami, they... Just have to realize that it's it's they, you have to go step by step. You know, if, if you if you end up with a point on a uh, point on Wednesday, you end up with a draw. That might not be as bad because of the team you're facing. Now let's let's touch on that game a little bit more. Um, it's at Drive Pink Stadium. Inter Miami returns home. For you, Jose, what is the key to the game for Inter Miami? What does Inter Miami have to do? the best or do a great job at to be able to at least get a result out of this game at least a draw but preferably obviously a win because Inter Miami needs points in a bad way I think they have to hold on to possession you know I think they have to defend with the ball just have possession throughout the game as much as you can Uh, be really patient you know don't let New England get into the into the rhythm where where they want to be don't let them 
um, dictate the tempo of the mm-hmm. game. You know, I think that's what Inter Miami has to do. Now, here's the problem with Inter Miami and possession. Um, I think if if you if you look at the attacking part of the field with the Lewis Morgan on the right side and let's say uh, Robbie Robinson plays on the left. Uh, um, they are not the type of player that is going to hold on to the ball. They look for the 1v1 opportunities immediately as soon as right. they get the ball. Right. So, you know, you're going to have to ask them to switch things up a little bit, right? You know, just hold on to the ball. Be aggressive when you have to you know, every single time because you're facing a very good team. So if you're going for the 1v1 battle and let's say you end up losing 60, 70 percent of those battles, you know, you're going to be giving the ball away right away. And that's not what Inter Miami needs to do, especially when you're facing a first place team, a first yeah. place team. I know there must be some some uh, type of uh, confidence within the team that oh yeah they're the first place, but we have quality, we can compete with them. Absolutely, that's very nice. But the reality is that they are a very good team, and if they have the ball for most of the match, you know it's not going to be an easy night for Inter Miami. So for me, the key to the game. Um, In the last few weeks, I've been saying the keys to the game for Inter Miami are being efficient in the final third, tener efectividad, because they don't create a whole lot, and the ones that they do create, they need to put away. That's what I've been saying for at least the last couple of games. This game, with what we know now, with what who might be missing, for me, the key to the game now is more on the defensive side, and that is locking up Carles Hill and Gustavo Bo, finding a way to keep those guys from making an impact, because... If you let them find their rhythm, find their game, and you know a way to do that, like you said, is keeping the ball, uh, defending with the ball, keeping possession so the other team doesn't have it, certainly a way to do that. But also just defensively in the man marking, in the individual assignments, keeping those two guys under wraps. Because if you let them influence the game, you're in for a tough day against the, this, this version of the New England Revolution. Those two players make right. an impact. You're probably not going to win that game. So that, that to me, is the key to the game. Keeping possession, I think, is going to be tougher, especially if Rodolfo Pizarro is out. We'll see. Again, still fluid. Haven't heard an official announcement if he'll be available Wednesday or not. He, The team will have availability on Wednesday, on, excuse me, on Tuesday, and we'll, we'll be able to attend practice for, for a portion of the training session. We'll talk to Phil Neville and a player or two after that. So we'll get an official update on Tuesday, but since we're recording this on Monday, we're still not clear on those details, whether Pizarro will be around on on Wednesday. Now, Jose, give me a starting lineup, please. Give me what you think Inter Miami will go with. Obviously, again, it's Monday. We don't know all the details, but just give me what you think Inter Miami could go with. Because if Pizarro's out... That obviously changes things for for Phil Neville. Yeah, I think it's going to be the same line, same lineup that um, they were um, they weren't trying to put out there during the weekend. Except that you know, if if Rodolfo Pizarro is not available, uh, we'll most likely see Jay Chapman there, like we have seen him yeah. um, whenever Pizarro is not is not available. But you know, of course, the big story is uh, Robbie Robinson coming back. You know. Um, just being fit enough to be in the starting 11 that tells you the story. Hopefully, you know, this is not the case in which, you know, if Robbie Robinson is not okay, then, you know, in the press conference, Phil Neville comes and he's, and tells us that, oh, well, it's his first game. He's not 100% ready because if he's ready to start, then, you know, we can expect a, a, a good level play from him, right? So um, I think there's not big changes. Hopefully we get to see Gibbs, although... It feels like uh, he's not ready yet. If he's if he was not yeah. ready during the week, and I doubt it that he's going to be ready for Wednesday. Yeah. Um, but I think that's going to be huge for Miami. I mean, Makun, I like the guy. I think he's he's uh, a good player. But of course, having the experience of Kieran Gibbs on the left uh, uh, as a left back would be will be huge for Miami. But I think it's going to be the same li- same lineup depending on what happens with Pizarro. If Pizarro is not available, then it's going to be Jay Chapman. Yeah, I'm not as high on McCoon as you, but I think McCoon's going to get the start at left back because I think from what I've been told, from what I've heard, Kieran Gibbs is a good ways away from being able to to start. Um, And when we spoke to him last week, he said, you know, the heat and humidity kind of caught him by surprise after, you know, 15, 20 minutes. You know, that really can take a toll. It's very different from what he's used to. So Yeah, it's just too soon. Yeah, it's it's too soon. He's coming from, from England. Um, he's coming off of a break. He had a, a, a vacation for several weeks, so he's pretty much starting from zero in terms of his fitness, or maybe close to zero. Maybe zero is not not accurate, but close to zero because he's been on vacation. 
He's had holiday, as they say, on that side of the pond. So it might be some time before we see him in the starting lineup on a consistent, consistent right. basis. But I, I agree with you that the move I think Phil Neville makes is Jay Chapman in for Rodolfo Pizarro if Pizarro can go. If Pizarro can go, it's going to be the exact same starting lineup, which we'll just run through really quickly because there there were some notes, some noteworthy inclusions. Nick Barsman was supposed to start in goal on Saturday. He was in the lineup. Um, so I imagine he'll start on Wednesday. Then you had Nicolas Figal at right back, Ryan Shawcross at right center back, Lando gonzalez Pires at left center back, Christian Lacoon at left back. You had Blaise Matuidi and Victor Ulloa on that first line of the midfield. Then, as we mentioned previously, Lewis Morgan on the right wing, Pizarro at the 10, Robbie Robinson at on the left wing, and Gonzalo Higuain up top. So Gonzalo Higuain also came back into the lineup which is a boost for Inter Miami in terms of quality. We'll see how that impacts the defensive side, the the pressing and the compactness and the shape, because obviously that's been an area where where he has struggled. Jose, what is your prediction for Wednesday night? Does Inter Miami end this losing streak with at least a draw, or does this <laughs> does it does it move on to a, a franchise record six games? I think we're going for the record. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now, yeah. so what 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 will be the score in this one? Does Inter Miami at least make a make a game out of it, or is this going to be a, a um, lo- as lopsided as the standings would indicate they should be? No, no. I mean, listen, it, it's MLS, right? I mean, there's uh, usually it's it's not it, it wouldn't be a huge surprise if Miami gets three points on Wednesday. Because it's MLS, you know, the level is not that far away one one team from from the other. Sure. Um, and, and anything can happen. But I think this is not going to be the night for, for Inter Miami. Uh, you know, listen, right now, uh, like I mentioned to start the, the show, I think the first 15 to 20 minutes are going to be key if uh, Inter Miami holds on to a nil-nil result for the first half an hour of the game. They could be in good shape and might end up still in a point from the game, but I think in the end it's going to be, um, uh, I'm going to go with uh, 3-1 um, New England. Okay, 3-1 New England. So a difference of two goals, yeah. and, you say, and you're saying Inter-Miami scores. Okay. I, I, yeah, they score. I, I think that they lose, and I think that they don't score. I think it's going to be, I think they'll lose 2-0. I almost went three, but listen, we have to take, we have to take into consideration, and fans should too, that New England did play on the weekend, whereas Miami, they didn't play, so they'll have fresher legs. And obviously it's a different situation than Orlando City when Orlando City last came to town because Orlando City, I think, was playing its third game in seven or eight days, whereas this will be in New England's second and four or five. bit different, but maybe Inter-Miami tries to take advantage of that. They did a good job of that against uh, Orlando City in terms of keeping the ball because they knew they weren't going to get high-pressed as much due to the tired legs. They also pressed Orlando City at certain times. So maybe Phil Neville has the team come out in that way, but at the end of the day, I think the quality New England has will be, and, and just the form that they're in, I think that will outdo Inter Miami's effort in this one, especially if Rodolfo Pizarro is not around. If Pizarro's around, I could see maybe a draw. Now, I'm not saying he's a difference maker, but it, it just tilts the, the, the balance a little bit more because he can keep possession, right. also can create. I think not having him is going to invite New England to have more of the ball, and that eventually will lead to, to some breakdown. So 2-0, the, the, loss, the losing streak uh, continues. But we'll see. We'll see. Hopefully for Inter-Miami fans and for the team, hopefully for their sake, Inter-Miami can pull a, a rabbit uh, out of the hat because... It wouldn't be a huge shock in terms of those of us who follow the league, but just based on the season and where the teams are, I mean, I think that would be a very eye-opening result if Inter-Miami can beat the New England Revolution. They're complete opposite ends of the tables. Very few things indicate that Inter-Miami should pull this one out, given, especially given the, the players that they'll be missing. But like you said, it is MLS, so... We'll right. see. We'll see. We'll see how it. We'll see how it goes. Jose, anything else you want to add on this game before we close this segment out and move on to the Q and A session? Anything else you want to touch on or or bring up with regards to to Wednesday night? Well, no. Just just to reiterate the point that you made about Rodolfo Pizarro, right? I mean, he's not going to win a game for you um, at the time with Inter Miami, 
but he's going to be a key and a very important player if he's available just because he can hold on to the ball. And, and, and you know, I think every single game is a step in the right direction when you have um, Pipita and Rodolfo Pizarro uh, on the field playing together. I still believe that at some point they will become the dynamic duo that um, Inter Miami needs. I, I think um, um, that connection at some point is going to happen. Um, they're going to build off, off each other. And if they don't play together for for so long, I mean, that's it's, it's only going to be harder and harder as the weeks go by. So Inter Miami needs that, and hopefully that starts happening on Wednesday. Yeah, we saw glimpses of that in week one against the LA Galaxy, and maybe the, the best half of soccer Inter Miami has played. That first half where, where they, I think they were up 1-0, and, and they combine yeah. uh, when Rodolfo Pizarro turns around midfield, hits that through ball in behind the defense, Gonzalo Higuain races onto it, and then he just squares it off to Robbie Robinson for the lead right before halftime. Right. Um, that, I think that, that, that's stuff we could see more of, or that, you know, we, I think Phil Neville wants to see more of things like that, moments like that of their quality, um, because obviously we haven't seen enough of that this year. Yeah, I think that game against LA Galaxy, that first game, is uh, exactly what Inter Miami needs when it comes to Rodolfo Pizarro. But we haven't seen it after that. And um, I, I remember after that game asking Phil Neville about, you know, um, if that was the plan, honestly, the plan with Rodolfo Pizarro, because he seemed to be doing whatever he wanted on the field, just running all over the place, right? He was just like a, a 10 but whenever he wanted to move to the wings, he was able to do so. And just very creative. Now, remember that that first game came after a short preseason for Miami. So um, what happened in that game, for people that don't remember, is that Rodolfo Pizarro got tired very quickly. After the first half, It was based, that was basically it for him because he didn't have a good preseason. So um, because for you to play at that level and to run around, especially in South Florida... Uh, yeah. For 90 minutes, I mean, you have to be ready. So he wasn't ready for the first game, although he was able to show um, some very good soccer, and hopefully we get to see it again soon. Hopefully, for the team's sake, they get to see it again soon, but it, it's tricky right now with with, uh, with Mexico's looming call-up, reported looming call-up. We'll, we'll take a quick break. We'll transition forward into our Q&A session and our final thoughts after this. Jose, it's Q and A time. Your first Q and A session on Miami Total Football Radio. Are you excited? I am. I am. Let's do it. <laughs> You're on the edge of your seat. I can feel it. I can feel it <laughs> through the mic. Um, okay. The first question comes from Joseph E, and it is Inter Miami related, but it also ties in Atlanta United. Atlanta United just lost its coach. Who's in a better position as of right now, Inter Miami or Atlanta? Jose, I'll let you start there. Unless you want to think about very it. Very good question. It is a really very good question. Very good question. It is a very right. good question. I, I'll start if you want some time to think about it. But if you have an answer right off the bat, you can you can go for it first. Um, listen, I won't be ready if you give me two weeks for this question <laughs> because it's a, it's a really really good question. Um, I would like to think that Inter Miami is at an advantage because um, I mean Phil Neville, they they have made progress. There's no doubt about it. I mean. I think, you know, it's just about, and going back again to this, it's it's Rodo Pizarro and Gonzalo Higuaín. If we see them connect in the next two months or so, um, they will make the playoffs. If not, then Atlanta is so much far away from Miami right now. You know, you talk about DPs in MLS. Well, for Inter Miami, DPs are the key of the game. That's what the way the, where they find success. I think Atlanta United they have a better collective effort and they just need a good coach. So that relies on both on those two key factors. Uh, right now, if I had to go for one team, I would say Atlanta United is closer. But um, I think Inter Miami, if those two players connect, they can make up ground really really quickly it's very diplomatic of you jose very uh politician of you there <laughs> um <laughs> i will say that i think inter miami even though it's in last place right now 
I think Inter Miami today is in a better position. Why? Because of Atlanta's transition that they're going to have to go through now. Interim coach coming in, uncertainty as to which players are going to stay, which players are going to go. That's going to play into the mentality of players for the rest of the season. They have to find a new head coach, so more changes will be looming in terms of who comes in, the coaching staff, the style. All these things have made Atlanta United drop from whatever they were at. I don't know, you know, if you wanted to put it one through ten, if they were at a at a four or five in terms of building something, they've now probably dropped down to a two or a one. So they're again, like I said before, with regards to something else, they're almost starting from scratch. When I was talking about Karen Gibbs, actually, they're almost starting from scratch. So Inter Miami at least has something. You know, it might not be something that's been great to this point, but they have something that's trying to be established. Something that Players are a little more familiar with. So from that sense, today, I think Inter Miami is ahead. Because anytime you start over, then you're, I mean, like I said, you're just starting over. <laughs> you know, save, sorry for the, the redundancy of that. But yeah, anytime you start over, um, it's, it's tougher than when you at least have something somewhat established for better or for worse. Next question comes from Gabe P., a regular listener. And he says, since Hainse, he's talking about Gabriel Hainse, Atlanta United's former head coach, since Hainsey got fired, I'm thinking who would be Atlanta's first coach, their head coach. I'll bet Gonzalo Pineda would be the pick. I think it would be an amazing pick to get Pineda for Miami in the future. What's your opinion of him and how do you rate him? Who would you pick for the Atlanta job? Okay, so it's not an Inter-Miami specific question. Uh, It's more of an Atlanta United question. I'll start here. And look, Atlanta United is in a tough situation right now. They've just fired their head coach after 13 games because of a lack of results and other factors that have started to trickle out, including him ignoring days off that are mandated by the collective bargaining agreement. He also limited how much water players could drink. A lot of different things have come out since his firing. Who do they pick? Well, that's that's the question. Because to this point, Atlanta United has gone foreign. They have gone for a flashier name, a bigger name. Started with Tata Martino. Then it was Frank De Boer. Now, or it was the most recently, Gabriel Heinze. So do they stick with that mold as the team that wants to be one of the flashier teams in the league? One of the teams that not only makes an impact on the field, but off the field that draws a lot of attention? Or do they try to look for something a little more safe, a little more stable, maybe a little more vanilla, but go... Someone that's uh, not as known and is more in tune with what MLS is. That's the decision that they're going to have to figure out and make. Gonzalo Pina, if they if they're looking to do that former route, stay within MLS. I think he's a good option. I think he's you know if you ask me what I think about him, I think he, yeah, I think he, he deserves an opportunity. But does he fit what Atlanta United wants in terms of being flashy and sexy? I mean, I don't think so. But I don't even know if they're going to stick with that route. What do you think, Jose? Do you think Atlanta goes? domestic or do you think they go again international this is a very important decision for Atlanta United this this could be a make or break for a lot of jobs over there yeah well I think they kind of have to go domestic at this point because uh, if you go back to what they have done after um, Frank De Boer was fired um, they had a little bit of more time and I don't think they have time right now. I mean, if they still want to compete this year, right? Because you want to get a, a coach that is going to take you to the next level, especially with the expectations from Atlanta United. Um, I think they, will, they they have to go domestic and, um, and just give it a try this year and see how it goes from there. Um, they are, you know, in, in not as bad a shape as uh, people would think because they have good players and, you know, essentially they're four points away from a playoff spot. So um, I think they're not as bad and, and they're just, uh, they have to move past the Gabriel Heinze era, which I think, I thought initially it was going to be successful. But after everything that has been reported in the last few days, I mean, it just makes sense for for Gabriel Hainsey to go back to the style that he likes and for Atlanta United to remain in the style that MLS is used to. Next question comes from Jason Siegel. It's been fun watching all this young talent for the U.S. It's a shame that MLS sells all their most promising prospects to other leagues. Do you think MLS would be better served spending, perhaps overpaying, to retain guys like DK instead of old internationals like Iguain? Um, mm. Jose... Uh, do you want to start there or do you want me to start? 
Uh, I can't start there. Okay. Go for um, it. Listen, um, <laughs> that's a topic that I've been talking about for years. All right. Um, it seems like that question is more oriented to the benefit of MLS. Sure. Right. If you think about the benefit of MLS, then okay, maybe. Yeah. If you're a fan of MLS as a league, right? But if you are a fan of uh, soccer or football in the country, it's 1,000 times better for players in MLS to go early to a, a higher level of play. And that will benefit um, the national team. That will benefit so many other factors within the game in the country as a whole, right? Yeah. Because if uh, the United States is successful as a national team, that relates to the entire soccer landscape in the United States. If the MLS is a good league, it's only going to be beneficial for the league. And I'm telling you this because eventually, and hopefully it's this way, the national team, the U.S. national team, will have only players, or mainly players, most of their players will be playing at the higher level, right? Because that make that makes sense for Greg Berhalter to call players that play at a higher level. And if you want to go to the World Cup and you have players like Christian Pulisic that you know compete regularly in the Premier League, that will take the United States a step closer to where they want to be in terms of World Cup, which yeah. is the main objective of every single country in the world. So you just have to realize that for the soccer landscape to grow in the United States, it has to grow for everybody, not just for MLS, and that goes through the national team. Yeah, so the question says, do you think MLS would be better served spending, perhaps overpaying, to retain guys like DK instead of older internationals like Iguain? So we've, so I'll answer it by saying this. We've seen this maybe a decade ago, where, where I was going to say it to remind me, where MLS made it a point to try to retain its domestic talent a bit more rather than to allow them to go to Europe. And they did this with specifically with U.S. men's national team players. This is how the allocation money initiative came to be in MLS because about 10 years ago, around 2011, 12, 13 is when the introduction of this started to make the news because MLS wanted to keep players like Matt Beasler, like Graham Zuzzi, Players that were on the national team, they wanted to keep them in MLS rather than allow them to go to Europe. So I think we've seen that approach, but I think the best approach, and I think MLS has realized this since as, as the league has further matured and as it's un unfolded a bit more, as the game has continued to grow here in this country, the best approach is to sell the young players. Because look, DK could be a stud for Orlando City, but he's not a flashy name that's going to put butts in seats by and large it's just just not going to do that you still need that star power even if it's on the later stage in the in a career now that's not not for every market but again just if you need some of that just to help put some casual fans into your stadium definitely need that and you also need to keep the, the money coming in you need the money coming in so how do you do that you sell players off for good transfer fees, younger players obviously sometimes make more. So MLS has realized that. They said that. I think I asked Don Garber the state of the league at MLS Cup 2018. And he said, look, we need to become more of a selling league. We've seen that now. Uh, there's rumors about uh, Gian, Gianluca Busio. There's, there's a, a bunch of different young players that have left MLS in the last oof, year and a half, two years. And I think that will be the way going forward because that's a more sustainable model in terms of business and it just makes more sense as well because you you need players of all types and especially in MLS where the, where the game is in this country today. You need some stars to come in and help draw fans, but you also need some young locals to help manage the salary cap as well as give you that right. that home feel, right? The, the home fans feel like they're... Like there's something that they can relate to on, on the team. Now we've got two more questions to go. So the next one comes from Lewis. And this is a two-tweet question. So bear with me here. The biggest issue Inter-Miami has is the poor transition from defense to midfield. Matuidi is to blame. Bench him. Am I crazy to propose a 4-3-2-1? Midfield being Ulloa, Pizarro, Chapman, and Robbie, and Morgan feeding Iguain. Chapman and Uyo would carry most defensive responsibilities, and Pizarro would 
play way back in the midfield, but allow for control and pass accuracy. So, Jose, do you want to start or do you want me to start? I can start. Right. No benching, no benching of the world champion, please. No, 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 no. That's not a good idea. I agree 100% that Blaise Matuidi was not the player that Inter Miami needs for quite a few games. And that was, you know, uh, concerning. I, I can see that. But um, I think in the game against Orlando City, I think we saw the Blaise Matuidi that, um, that we like. And um, if he's able to maintain that level, there's no way he's not in the starting 11. So, no, no, he needs to play. Absolutely. And um, I think he's actually that player that can very easily make the transition um, from defense. And not only from defense to the midfield, but from defense to offense. He can be that um, two-way player. So I'm going to agree, disagree, and disagree. And I'll explain myself here. I agree that an issue Inter-Miami has is its transition from defense to attack and from attack to defense. I agree that they have struggles on both sides. It's something that's gone back to last year. There's plenty of reasons for that. We can talk about that on uh, on another pod and dissect that a little bit more. I absolutely think that that's an issue that they have. I think speed is one of the reasons for that because they don't have a whole lot of it. But again, we can talk about that at a, at a later later time. But I disagree with you in that you shouldn't drop him. I think... If he can't maintain that level consistently, if we see the Blazeman Tweedy we've seen for much of his time here, Jose, I think it's I think he can go to the bench. I know that's he's a DP and you need the DPs to perform in MLS in order to really maximize your talents. But look, Inter Miami's midfield is struggling and has struggled for uh, a while by and large. So if he cannot repeat that type of performance or that level of performance, then look, I, I'm not opposed to seeing Gregory and Chapman in there and seeing how that works or, or you know maybe even the four three two one here that that uh that Lewis mentioned. So that that's my other part. The other part that I would that I would disagree with is Lewis's point that the biggest issue is the transitions. I think it's a major issue. I don't think it's the biggest issue. The biggest issue is that this team can't score goals. They have nine goals and if you can't score, you're not going to win. So that to me is the biggest issue, but I agree by and large with him that that, that this transition is uh or the the poor transitioning is a key issue is a key issue. The last question comes from Twitter and he says, is he's directing it to me, but Jose of course chime in here. You mentioned that you don't expect Inter Miami to win again until they play Montreal on July thirty first. Now it looks like he's. <laughs> I did say that over the weekend. I did say that that's what I what I thought because they have Philadelphia on the weekend, New England on Wednesday. Now it looks like Pizarro will be joining Mexico to replace Lozano, and Mexico is expected to play in the final, which is August 1st. Do you think Inter-Miami can still win against Montreal without Pizarro? I'll start on this one just because it's directed at me, and then Jose, of course, you can you can add in um, what you think, your two cents. I will say that I still think Inter-Miami can get a result out of that Montreal game because you know Montreal is playing pretty decently right now. They're in fourth place in the Eastern Conference, but I think Inter Miami can put up a fight, even without Pizarro. I think they could. And we saw that in this most recent game at Red Bull Arena, not not this past weekend, but the one before this two week break. Inter Miami lost one to zero. Obviously they gave up a lot of chances in the first half. Probably should have lost by more. But I think Inter Miami could put up a fight against Montreal. And this especially if the DPs like Iguain are you know, close to their best on the day. So I, I still think Montreal, they could they could still win, could, but I won't say that they will. Um, No, I happen to disagree with you. Okay. I don't think they will win against uh, Montreal. Um, listen, if we have to set a date for the next uh, <laughs> Inter-Miami win, I think I would go, you know, a little bit further than that. Okay. Um, I, I how, would, lo- how long does the losing streak or does the winless streak go, Jose? Tell us. Tell us uh, what you I, think. I think it'll go all the way to August uh, um, 18 when they play the Chicago Fire. That is I a think. long time to go without a win, my friend. Yes, I think that's the day. So if you want to you know, make plans for a cele- <laughs> Inter Miami celebration, I will go with that. I know it's, far, it's, it's almost a month away from that. But yeah, I, well, I think 
again, Franco expectations, you know, that that's the reality of the team and mm -hmm. moving forward. I don't know what's, what's going to happen, especially with the sanctions and everything that's going to happen in the next two seasons. I don't know. I don't know. Hopefully they turn things around. I think they, they're capable of doing it, but I don't, I just think new England is a better team. Um, Philadelphia union is a better team. Montreal, I think uh, are, are they? I think they're all, they're quite the opposite from Inter Miami at the moment, right? I think they're they are in a six game win streak, something like that, or they haven't lost in six games, something like that. Yeah. So I think they they will be fine against Inter Miami, Orlando City. Yeah, they should be fine. Nashville, which you know, every time I see Nashville, I'm like, oh my god, it's unbelievable. At the same time, both teams coming in the league at the same time, and how can they be so different? <laughs> um, New York City, maybe there's a chance that it's against New York City, but I'm sure Chicago Fire, that's the game. So look, I will say two things to that before we go to our final thoughts, and one is. Fans, I know some fans are waiting for Papa John's. You know, there's that 50% discount for Papa John's <laughs> if they get a, if they get a result. I know fans are waiting, and that'd be a long time for them to wait for that Papa John's because they've been waiting for weeks, months now to 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 be able to cash in on that discount. But look, August 18th, I think they what? will win sooner than that. I think just just because look at look at the schedule, even with the matchups and whatnot, four out of the next five games for Inter Miami are at home at Drive Pink Stadium. I think they'll pull one of those out. One of those they'll win. I just that's you know, just call it a gut feeling or just a, just statistically I'm looking at being at home and you know teams home teams normally tend to play stronger or better. So I think they'll pull out one of those and I think the Montreal game is the one that they maybe could pull out. Maybe they go to Orlando City and and you know it's with the derby and the rivalry and the emotions of that. You know maybe they can pull that out. But no, I, I think. The game that they have the best chance at is is the one against CF Montreal on July 31st. So we'll see. We'll see how it breaks down because, you know, a, a losing or a winless run of that many games till, till August 18th, oof, I don't know. That's that's tough to it's tough to, to make any case for, for the team and for the coach from that point. But we have seen it before, Franco. In MLS, we have seen it before. A really bad, bad year. Listen, what happened with this United in the last few years? They were really bad. Colorado Rapids as well. So um, I don't know. I don't know. It's just a reality for me, sure. right? Of course. Sure. I mean, it, it could it could change because, like we mentioned before, um, Inter Miami, they do have talent. And sometimes, uh, Franco, you can win a game out of individual an individual effort, sure. right? A free kick. Maybe you get a... Uh, a red card that goes your way late in the game. You know, those are little things mm -hmm. that can change th that can change the outcome of a game. But, you know, so far, we cannot predict that. We're trying to look at what the other team might bring to the table, what Inter Miami has at the moment. And based on that, I think that's the date. Now, things, things could change. Watch Inter Miami go on a three-game winning streak, and then when they score their goals, they lift up the shirt and says, "Jose, you are so wrong." <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll see. We'll see. Look, soccer is a crazy, a crazy sport. Football is a crazy sport. You know, so many unpredictable things happen, like you just mentioned. So I think at some point, Inter Miami will get a break, and something will go their way, and they'll they'll be able to pull out a win sooner than that. But we'll see how it goes because they are not in a great state. I do want to ask you one thing before we go to our final thoughts. This is my question, so I guess I'll throw this out there for you because I don't think I got to ask you this before. Okay. You said something you said earlier that you don't think the expectations by and large are where they should be for this team. I I would like yeah. to hear your more thought more of your thoughts on that as well as why the team is where it's at. Why are they in such a bad way? Why are they not even in the playoff picture. Why are they at the bottom of the Eastern Conference? What has led to a team that came in with so much fanfare and so many expectations to be where it is now? Well, I think the expectations are way too high because of the ownership. Mm -hmm. I think the ownership, um, you know, build a story that um, they could envision, but that they didn't have... Um, I, I guess they didn't understand exactly what where they, they, they were going to be facing in terms of how MLS um, plays, right? The expectations about this team when you start from the foundation and talk about big names and you allow those big rumors to become the key story surrounding your, surrounding your team, um, 
you know that 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 race that actually raised the level of expectation not only of the Inter Miami fans but everybody else around the globe, because Inter Miami is a global brand. There's no doubt about it. Because people like to read what happens with Inter Miami. The problem is that not many people understand the day to day of Inter Miami, and that happens a lot in the U.S. So. Now, when it comes to the expectations of the fans here in South Florida, um, I think they were just hoping for the best. Uh, and maybe the fact that we did not have MLS for so long here, you start to understand a little bit more what the league is and what the level of, of the league really is. And at this point, you know, Inter Miami is just trying to recover from a bad year because uh, of the decisions that were made in their first year. So, you know, this is the second year for the franchise, but it is actually the first because you change so many things, starting with Diego Alonso, which, by the way, I think he deserved a second season mm -hmm. because when he came in, most of the team was already hired and he didn't make a decision on what players are coming in and he got um, Blaze and, and Iwain late. So um, I think he deserved another year, but I'm going to leave that at that. And um, now with the restart prior to this year, um, you already had to deal with so many things from last year and the decisions that were made by Paul McDonald and the front office because, I mean, everybody's responsible. Mm -hmm. So you have to work with that and you have to kind of find a way to move through that. And that takes some time. That's not going to happen from one day to the other. And that's very hard for a fan to understand. You know, that's very, very hard. Maybe for you and me, we see it every day. But for a fan that usually watches the game on TV every weekend, that's a challenge. And that's why the expectations of the fans are not where they, honestly, where they should be. So I think it's more, and I've said this multiple times, and I'll go on record and say it again. I think it's more of kind of what you touched on initially with what the ownership is and what they've also expressed publicly. Because even this year, at the start of this year, when we had the, and I believe you were there, if I'm not mistaken, I, I'm pretty sure my memory doesn't, I mean, I'm getting older, but my memory is still pretty good. I believe you were there at the Jersey unveiling back in February. And Jorge Mas said in a scrum that he expected or wanted Inter Miami to be a top three team in the Eastern Conference, which... They're nowhere close to. But those no. are the messages that they portray. They they always talk about being a, one of the more competitive teams in the league and being a team that is one of the biggest on this side of the hemisphere and is, is internationally renowned. And all these things, they come from leadership or people in leadership positions. So I think that's where the expectations come. And I think, listen, that's where me personally, that's where I match them up against. Because if that's what they're striving to be, then that's, that's their benchmark, then okay, then that's what I'm going to hold them. That's the standard I'm going to hold them to. And look, you, there's there's games where you don't play well, but if you don't play well on a consistent basis, then I'm, and you're, you're saying your benchmark is up here, then obviously there's a lot of criticism because for being down here and up there is there's a big gap in between, right? So um, right. Uh, and, that, that's just that's just my my personal my personal viewpoint on it. Um, and even Chris Henderson, who I rate highly, has said publicly. He thinks that this can be a you know a juggernaut of a team for for lack of a better uh, a better phrase and you know he didn't use that exact word but more along the lines of that and I agree that eventually it can be because it has a deep pocketed owner it has an owner that cares and it's willing to spend and looking to to try to make something out of this team I think it's going to take time but if today there's you know if if this season they're saying hey, they want to be top three Eastern Conference team, then that's the standard I, I will hold them to. Right. And, you know, the one thing that I think Inter-Miami has been missing, and um, um, maybe you have some info that I, that I don't have about this, but um, I think from the get-go, um, Marcelo Claure um, should have been involved in, 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 in every single decision because he was the one guy from the ownership group that had experience managing uh, a soccer team. And um, I know there have been reports lately that he's trying to sell um, uh, whatever percentage he owns of the team. But I think he was the, the guy that you needed to listen to. And I'm, I'm not sure they have been listening to him or how involved he has been. Because even after 
buying Inter Miami, he has been involved with with other teams. Of course, Bolivar in in Bolivia, because I mean that's actually his team. Yeah. Girona in Spain, and um, I think it's the one guy that could have helped a lot. And um, uh, I maybe it's too late, but if it's not, I, I think maybe they should listen to him a lot. I think it might be too late, man. I think right. it might be too late. Right. Um, yeah. But we'll we'll wrap it up there with the Q and A session, Jose. Thank you so much for joining us. Before we let you go, I want to hear you know your final thoughts. Again, I appreciate you coming on. Unfortunately, we didn't have as much soccer to talk about as we initially expected, but we'll have you back on for sure because I think me and you, you and I, can have some really good football chats. But <laughs> Jose, final thoughts. Stage is yours. All right. Um, fine. Let's talk a little bit about the Gold Cup. How about that? Okay. I've been covering Gold Cup, so um, listen. Let's talk a little bit about the Gold Cup. Um, what can we expect in, in, the, in the quarterfinals and semifinals in the final? Listen, I think it's going to be a very interesting end to the Gold Cup because through the group stage, all the teams that were supposed to move on to the next round have been able to do so. So it's going to be very interesting to see what happens in CONCACAF with Gold Cup. And especially because just a few weeks from now, the World Cup qualifiers will start and uh, we're going to have three matches in September in the in the FIFA dates to start the, the World Cup qualifier. And I think the Gold Cup could set up the stage. Let's talk about the U.S. because, of course, that's the team in the, con- the country we live in. I think it's going to be a challenge for the United States, but they don't really care that much about the Gold Cup because they already have Nations League. So I'm going to predict something very special here right now. <laughs> I don't think... Either Mexico or the U.S. win the Gold Cup. How about that? Okay, wow, okay. That's only happened once in the Gold Cup's history. That was Canada that won. Blanking if it was 2000 or 2001, but it's only happened once. Every other Gold Cup has been won by the U.S. and or Mexico. And the wild part there, which makes the stat even more mind-boggling or eye-opening or whatever, however you want to describe it, is that the Gold Cup gets played very often. Every two years, as opposed to every four, so... It, the fact that Mexico and the U.S. have won almost every single one of them, and for them for that not to happen this time, as you're predicting, would be obviously very, very noteworthy. And for me, I have two final thoughts. Phil Neville expressed a couple of weeks ago some irritation, some frustration with Mother Nature because of the inclement weather that had interrupted some of his training sessions and had po- postponed some of his training sessions. I've even been told that some of them were canceled, had to be canceled because of lightning delays or because of just poor, poor weather. So I can only imagine that now that frustration and that irritation has reached another level because of what happened over the weekend. Hopefully the weather holds up this week for the two games that Miami has on its schedule, and hopefully the games can be played. Now, as I reported last week, after we finished recording last week's episode of Miami Total Football Radio, has Ventura Alvarado, the former U.S. men's national team player, on trial. He's been in camp for a couple of weeks. He's a center back. Now, if you're wondering why they would bring in a center back, we haven't been told why that is. I haven't been told why that is. Obviously, they have quite a few players there, but I imagine the thinking is longer term because as Steve El Primo Brenner has reported previously here on Miami Total Football Radio, Inter Miami is probably going to have to get rid of two of Leandro Gonzalez Pires, Nicolas Figal, and Julian Carranza due to the sanctions that came down from MLS after the Blaise Matuidi investigation was concluded. So that's at least what I would surmise from the from right now, from the outside, but we'll see how it all plays out and whether Ventura Alvarado is even signed. But that does it for this week's show. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Jose Armando, for joining us. We'll be back later this week to recap the game against the New England Revolution and preview the Philadelphia Union game on the weekend. So we're not done just quite yet. We'll be back again in a few days. For Jose Armando, I'm Franco Penizo. This is Miami Total Football Radio. And we'll